You know, usually when we start out the new year, I try to be a little bit prophetic, and I try to give an encouraging, inspirational message that um, will help you to go farther. And if you hang in with me until the end of the message, I think you'll see that that's true. But I just want to warn you to start with, um, I'm going to be realistic this morning about where we are as a society. And I think it helps us to understand where we really are. You know, it would be so great to stand up here and to tell you that 2020 is going to be better than any year you've ever experienced, that God is going to be pouring out His Spirit upon you, that you're going to be tiptoeing through the tulips for the rest of the year, and that everything's going to come together. How many of you wish I would talk like that? Okay, two people. But you know what? That's not reality. So what I want to show you this morning is where we are. Where as Christians, where uh, as a church, the church in general, where we are in society, where our society's at so that we can experience life. I want you to know that there is real hope and there is real life for us to experience But it might not be in exactly the way you would dream if you're just dreaming about everything coming together for you. So for my New Year's series, I'm going to talk about swimming upstream. Swimming upstream. I grew up around the Brooks area. And the Brooks area is a really dry area. In fact, the standard old joke for that area is is that during the flood, that's during the time of Noah and the ark, they had two inches of rain at that time. (laughs) That's just to show you how dry that area is. But they have irrigation. They have irrigation, and irrigation lets people produce good crops. And the benefit, the real benefit, forget the crops, But the real benefit as a young boy was that there was a lot of canals that you could go swimming in. And uh, we even had a creek running through our property and the water came all the way up to here on me as a young boy. So that that was an ideal place to spend a lot of hours in the summertime. And then as I got older, there was bigger and more important swimming places that a guy could go. All part of the canals, they'd have dam structures, and then just down from the dam structure, the water would come rushing, and it would wash out places, and it was a lot of fun to go swimming. There was always numerous kids that would swim in these places. It was a lot of fun. Everybody just about could swim downstream. Swimming downstream was easy. All you had to do was to figure out how to move your hands a little bit and kick your feet, dog paddle in other words, and you could just stay afloat and you could start up at the structure and you could go down with the current quite a ways and a lot of fun. Most people could do that, but there was only the good swimmers that could swim successfully against the current and head upstream. To swim upstream was a, was a lot harder, and that was kind of the challenge, to be able to swim against the current and make headway. Not to, not to just stay afloat swimming upstream, but to actually um, swim upstream towards the dam setups that were there. And I think that we can make a real comparison between swimming upstream Swimming upstream as a kid and swimming upstream in life. Everybody can just float downstream. That's what's easy. Most people can just go downstream, do what comes easy in life, do what comes naturally in life. But you know what? There's not real life just floating downstream. Let me give you a couple of small examples to show you what I'm talking about. You know, I remember going back down memory lane this morning, I guess, but I remember when I had a job and I was driving a truck and the drivers and the swampers and the crew 
would get together and over coffee and we would, um, the standard thing was to run down the boss and to run down the company. That was absolutely easy. I don't know, do people still do that today around coffee shops? I'm sure you guys are a lot smarter than, than, than we were at that time. But it's really easy, isn't it? It's really easy to get together and to criticize and to say negative things. But you know what? All that does in you is develop a bad attitude inside of you. And that's going to make it pretty hard for you to be promoted. Because your boss isn't going to want to promote somebody with a bad attitude. It's harder to swim upstream, but swimming upstream, deciding that you're going to have a bad attitude, even though your boss is an idiot, deciding that you're going to have a good attitude will go a long way towards you yourself achieving the life that you want to live. You know, another small example, example, example of this is in our marriages, right? When you get together with somebody else, do you run down your spouse? Don't do that. You see, because what you're doing is if you get together with somebody and you're running down your spouse, you're building that up in your own mind. If you need help absolutely go and get help. If you need counseling, if you're struggling in your marriage, and a lot of people do, there's no shame in that, go and get help. But don't just sit in the coffee shop or wherever you are over the kitchen table with your friends and diss your spouse. That will just build negative stuff inside of you and will actually hurt your marriage. So don't do that. Swimming upstream, deciding that I am going to... Making the choice that I am going to love my spouse, that you are going to love your spouse, even in spite of their imperfections. And everybody has imperfections, including you. Making the choice that you're not going to go along with the flow, but you're going to go upstream. I am so thankful, I've shared this before, but I'm so thankful that about five years into my marriage, I went for a walk with my sister. And I was complaining to my sister about Joyce. And I remember very plainly, she stopped and she looked at me and she said, Chuck, I think you've got it pretty good which I did have. And I, I've often thought about that because that changed my attitude towards my wife. Not that I had a bad attitude towards her, but I was picking up on some of the, after five years, anyways, I'm going to dig myself in a, a <laughs> hole here, so I better move on. But how much worse would have it been if my sister would have just agreed with me and fed that negative stuff in my life? My sister herself decided that she was going to swim upstream. Mind you, for her, and she listens to these sometimes, I know, Ruth, that it's easy for you to swim upstream, so you don't get too much credit for that. But my sister in herself swam upstream to not just agree with me, but to tell me exactly where I was at. And so I've always appreciated that. Life is easy going with the current, but real life is found swimming upstream. I want to just share a little bit with you now where we are at as a society. I had uh, a pastor tell me about a blog that somebody um, had written. Actually, his name was Kirk Durston, and I send it to some of the leaders in the church here, to the deacons board anyways. I send it to the deacons board, and his blog was about, uh, it was a study on the effects of sexuality and morality in society in general. And the blog was based on a book called Sex and Culture, which was published in 1936. 1936, this book was published. And it was written by J.D. Unwin, who was an Oxford social anthropologist. 
And the book, Sex and Culture, summed up his lifetime of research. And we don't know, but his writings suggest that he was not a religious man. So he's just studying facts and figures about sexuality, okay? In the book, he studied 86 societies and civilization just to see if there was a relationship between sexual freedom and how the culture would thrive. And to sum up, the blog was kind of lengthy, but to sum up what the book said, it said societies that have an attitude of no sex before marriage and then monogamous relationships after marriage, society which accepted these things as their standard flourished. They exceeded every other culture in every area, and that includes literature, art, science, furniture, agriculture, engineering, and agriculture, architecture and agriculture. So societies that basically followed Scripture, and this wasn't a Christian guy probably who wrote this book, I mean, we don't know, but it wasn't based on Christian principles. It was just based on just based on history. Societies that basically followed Christian principles flourished, and societies that didn't, the converse, the opposite of this, ab, um, actually was true as well. Societies that changed their attitudes about virginity and monogamy probably only lasted three generations or 100 years. After three generations, these societies were taken over by other cultures and there wasn't any exception to this happening. What I thought was so interesting is usually after one generation, rational thought disappeared. Think about it. My generation, in the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, my generation changed their attitude about sex. And that would mean we have about a hundred years before our society doesn't exist the way we know it before another nation comes in and takes us over, or before our society deteriorates to such a point that we don't recognize it anymore. After one generation, rational thought disappeared. And I mean, if, if you look at where we are on this timeline, if this book is true. If you look at where we are on this timeline, we're beginning the second generation. We're, we're partially in the second generation already. And I mean, if you think about some of the things that society is buying into, you can see that we've lost rational thought. Some, some stuff that society said doesn't even go along with science anymore. I mean, science, science says different stuff, but, but I mean, I, I could go on and on about this when it comes to emotional issues, emotions now, and feelings. Father, don't let me get into rants this morning, please. When you look at um, issues, like when it comes to emotional issues, that becomes more important than facts now. You know, our attitude towards sex, our attitudes towards sex change stuff just doesn't make any sense at all. And science doesn't even back it up. And yet we are headed down this road and we seem to be embracing more and more of this stuff. Where is, where is, where is our rational leadership? Just to be clear, 
And I'm going to move on from this. This is not a rant about sexuality, but I thought this just absolutely shows that how if we swim upstream where society wants to take us, that is where we're going to find life. I'm not here to make anybody feel guilty this morning. Everyone here in this room has a past. And like I said, for communion, it's not where you've been, it's where you're going. And kind of like the Apostle Paul when he was addressing the sort of issues that I've talked about for just a little bit here this morning, the Apostle Paul says, and such were, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and the Spirit of our God. You see, the beautiful part of this is, is when we come to Jesus Christ, Our past can be wiped out and we can head in a different direction in life. I just want you to know this morning that real life, real life is found in swimming against the culture, swimming against the stream. You see, you cannot buy into where our culture is going if you want to be successful this year. So what do we need to do? How can we live successfully in 2020. The first thing is we need to recognize the problem. We need to recognize that there is a problem where society is headed, where Canada and the U.S. are headed, and we have to make sure that we don't buy into this ourselves. In Revelations 18.4, it says, Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you partake in her sins and lest you share in her plagues. You see, we ourselves have to make sure that we don't buy into what society is saying about so much stuff because that is not where life is. We need, to, we need to go against the flow. We need to go against the current because that's where life is. In Isaiah 3, 4, it just explains, it just explains what's going on. You know, when I, when I first became, when I first became serious about following Jesus, the books of Jeremiah and Isaiah especially became very real to me. And as I was reading about those prophets, it just came to me that these prophets, when they started, the birds were singing and the sun was shining and everything was going okay in the land. And yet here were these prophets that would come and they would say, the path you're on is not right. The path you're on is going to bring destruction. And it just kind of reminded me when I was about 25 or 30, maybe, probably mid-20s, when I was that age in my life, I saw that there was a real comparison between what was going on in Canada, what was going on in our world, and what was going on in the nation of Israel at that time. Except I wasn't mature enough or brave enough, I don't know, maybe I still wouldn't be to stand up and to say, hey, where we're going is not right. And this is not me railing against society. I hope you don't hear me railing against society. The moral of the story this morning is how can we be successful in 2020? How can we make progress ourselves in 2020? We need to understand where society is and what's going on. In Isaiah 3, 4, a good example is I will make boys their leaders and toddlers their rulers. Where is rational thought sometimes now? You know, we need to remember that God wrote the owner's manual and he knows how we are designed to function. And we need to know that his ways always lead to life. We need to recognize the problem and change. If we're buying into some of the stuff that society is telling us that is going against what Scripture says, we need to change. 
We need to change the way we think ourselves. We need to change our own direction. We need to change our own heart. And you know, that ain't easy. That ain't easy. And in fact, if you're trying to do it in your own strength by yourself, it's probably impossible. I'm sure there's some people who have the strength of character that have the, the, the willpower to change their behavior like that. But let me tell you, those people are very few and far between. What you need to do is to ask God to help you. Ask God to help you make the changes that you need to make. Ask God to give you the strength to make the changes that you need to make. And you know, what I've noticed in my own life and in the life of other people is sometimes we don't want to change. Sometimes we like being where we are. We like, we like doing the things we do. Even if we're caught in addiction, we like our addiction. That's why we stay in our addiction. So what do you do if that's the case? Pray to God. Pray and ask God to change your heart. Pray and a scary prayer to pray is, God, change my heart. Take me to a place where I don't want to do that thing anymore. And God will help you with that. The other thing that you need to do Or another suggestion for you to do is to ask other people for help as well. Number one, ask God, but then go to other people and ask them for help too, especially if you're caught in some addiction. You know, people heal when things aren't kept in the dark. So go to somebody and ask them for help and get professional help too, if you need to. We need to change the way we think about sin. We need to, I don't think, I honestly don't think that we understand the seriousness and the consequences of sin. You know, I think so often people think that if they mess up, that God is going to be there with a two by four to slap us on the side of the head if we mess up. I don't believe that's the case. Occasionally that may be the case. But that's a pretty rare thing. More often than not, what happens is God lets you suffer the consequences for your actions until you are willing to change, until you yourself are willing to go. You see, we think... Another thing is Christians... We need to stop believing that God will spare us from the consequences of our actions. When God created the world, when he created the system, it was his will for their things to be things like the law of gravity. And I'm so thankful for the law of gravity. I had a dream the other night where we were just tethered together. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I'm sure it's a real spiritual dream. I'm speaking sarcastically. We were tethered together, and and then people could just float off into the abyss. I'm so glad for gravity that we don't do that sort of thing. But you need to understand that if you're working on a building, you can't just jump down to get the hammer you forgot if you're working on a 20-story building. Gravity will come into effect and the effects won't be pleasant. You see, God set up the law of gravity, but God set up numerous other laws as well. And if we go against those things, we ourselves suffer harm. If I continually mistreat my wife or if I continually mistreat my children. I can't just do that continually and pray at the same time that God would spare my marriage and God would bring me a close family. That sort of stuff just doesn't work. We need to stop believing that all that happens is that we get hit on the side of the head with a two by four 
And so we live hoping that doesn't happen. What we need to do is we need to understand that we suffer the consequences for our action. God wrote the operator's manual. He knows how we function better. He knows um, he's put some things in place. We need to stop thinking that sin is just something that God said we shouldn't do because God is coming up with ideas to keep us from having fun. We need to understand that sin destroys us. And not only, it wouldn't be so bad if sin only destroyed you. But it doesn't. It destroys the people that are around you as well. We suffer the consequences for our actions. So let's be aware of that and recognize that there is a problem. And I could go around the room and each one of us if we were honest, could say there is a problem. But that doesn't excuse the problems in our own lives. Okay, how many of you want me to move on to better things? Okay. (laughs) Only one of you. So I want you to know... No, the second thing is, no, there, the first thing is, no, there is a problem. But the second thing, also, no, there's hope. You know, there's hope. A verse I noticed in Isaiah chapter 3, going back to Isaiah coming alive to me. This goes way back to what I noticed a lot of years ago. In Isaiah chapter 3, Verse 9 compares the culture there of Israel with Sodom. And it says, they are proud of their sin. The people at that time were proud of their sin. And verse 9 says, woe to them. Can I throw in something for free? You know, and I'm guilty of this as well, but you know, A lot of times we get together and we joke about how we acted before. Before we gave our life to Jesus Christ, we we joke and we think it was smart, that stuff that we did. Why do we think that's smart? Why do we think that's smart? Why do we think that type of behavior is so cool? Why do we laugh about that? We need to change our attitudes towards some of that stuff. I remember there was a girl who was with a group of people who were talking about the parties and stuff that they used to have. This is when I was a lot, lot, lot younger. And I I appreciate the girl. She, She said, if that life was so fun, why don't you go back to it? You see, there's not life back over there. Know, know that there is hope. See, it's easy for me to get off track. Know there is hope. Verse 9 says, woe to them because they're proud of their sin. You know what verse 10 says? You know what verse 10 says? Tell the righteous it will be well with them, for they will enjoy the fruit of their deeds. Woe, but Verse 10 is, tell the righteous it will be well with them. So I want to tell you this morning, if you can go against the flow with society, if you can start making wise choices and start following the operator's manual, start following um, the Bible, start, start making that the basis for what you want, I want you to know that things will be well with you. Woe to those who are proud of their sin. Tell the righteous it will be well with them. And then um, chapter 5, verse 8, more woes. Woe to those who add house to house and field to field until there's no room for anyone else in the land. He's dealing with greed. Verse 11, woe to those who rise up early in the morning with the goal to get drunk. Verse 20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Verse 21, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes 
And I could go on, but the point that I got at that time and the point that is still true for us today is tell the righteous it will be well with them. You see, if you make a choice that you're going to follow God this year, and I don't expect that you're going to be perfect in this, and I don't expect that you're not going to make any mistakes, but if you make it your choice and your goal that you are going to follow God in 2020, and if you mess up, you're going to get back up on your feet and you're going to continue to go, if that is your goal, I want you to know and I want you to hear this morning, tell the righteous it will be well with them. I want you to know that there is hope. There is hope. When the children of Israel went into captivity in Babylon because of what Isaiah and Jeremiah had prophesied came true, their society, their, their culture was destroyed at that time and they were dragged off to captivity in Babylon because of their behavior. Listen to what Jeremiah said even in the midst of this. In Jeremiah 29, 11, God said to the people, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. For those people that were drug off to Babylon, God still had a good plan for them. And God still has a good plan for you this morning. God still has good life for you this morning. Look at what he told the people who were drug off into captivity in a few previous verses. In verse 5 he says, Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. That sounds like even though there was a lot going on and even though it didn't seem like things could or should be positive for them. God had a plan and a hope for them and God told them to have families, to, to build businesses. I believe that's what God is telling us this year as well too. To have families, to build businesses, to go forward, to, to do more, to expect to be blessed of God. We need to be aware of where society is going, but I want you to know that this can be your finest hour. This can be the time where you make more of a difference than you've ever made in your life before. Do you know what the world needs now? What the world needs now is not Christians to, to stand up on stages or stand on street corners or stand in coffee shops and tell everybody that they're going to hell that they're going to hell and the world is going to hell in a handbasket. What needs to happen is Christians need to point people in a better way. We need to, we need to make a difference ourselves. You know, I read a book not too long ago and it was talking about the financial crisis that there was in the U.S. because of the mortgage thing. And how that took the U.S. off course because there was stuff that was going on I'll pretend I know what I'm talking about. But there was stuff going on at that time that was just fraudulent. And people were making money off of the fraud with that thing. And it took the whole society down. You know what happened in England a period of time before that? I forget exactly what it was, but the, the book talked about it. It said that England was headed down that same path. But there was a Christian man who stood up and called the country out on what was going on and the country changed its path. You see, that's what we're called to do. We need to, we need to take a chance and stand for righteousness and, stay and say, you know what, as businesses, we are not going to take advantage of other people. You know, there's nothing the matter with making a good profit. You know, the Christianity, God needs you. Well, God doesn't anyway. You know, we need money, right? We need money so that we can help the poor. We need money so that we can do the things that God has called us to do. And if you're going to be in business, make money. 
There's nothing the matter with making money, but stand for righteousness at the same time. Do things that are right at the same time. Be a Christian businessman. I read a book not too long ago, and I was thinking that I should give this book to some of my deacons. And it talked about how you should have a Bible in one hand in the morning, be reading the Word of God and meditating on the Word of God and have the stock market report in your other hand. Not so you know what to invest in. This isn't, this isn't but so you, can, so you can make a difference in this world. That's what this is all about. It's time for us to stand up as school teachers, not to be ignorant not to, not to fight with the government per se, although some of that needs to be done. But what needs to happen is we ourselves need to be different so people can see that there is a better way to live. We need to... How many of you know we need to? This can be our finest hour. This can be our finest hour. This can be a time where we go to, where we experience real prosperity, where we experience the things that God would have us experience. But it's upstream. It's upstream. And my last point this morning, and it's a short one, so you can start clapping. (laughs) But you know where God lives? You know where God lives? God lives upstream. In Revelation 22 it says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Verse 2, down the middle of the great street of the city. So it's from the throne room of God that the stream flows. And I believe it's the same thing that's described in, e- in Ezekiel. Prophecy in the Old Testament describes the same river and the farther downstream you go, the bigger the river gets. It starts off ankle deep if you read the passage. You go a little farther downstream, it's knee deep. You go farther downstream, it's waist deep until it gets so big and so deep that you can't cross it. And where it goes, it brings life. Where it goes, it brings life. But do you know where God is? This is really deep theology. Do you know where God is? He's upstream. He's upstream. You know, in the last two years... The last two years I've been preaching about the kingdom of God. I so appreciate, I think it was the last song that you sang this morning, Dave. It's talking about the kingdom of God. You see, there's a whole, there's a whole different way for us to live. There's a whole new life for us. The kingdom of God is where, is where we live without lack. It's not where we have everything we're greedy for, but where we can experience life without lack, where we can experience the joy and the peace of God, where, where we come to the place where what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, what we talk about, what we call the Sermon on the Mount. You know what the Sermon on the Mount is? And I've said this before, and I've heard numerous other Preachers say it before. What the Sermon on the Law on the Mount does is it takes the law and it takes the law, makes it tougher and harder. That is, I'm standing on the stage. That is not true. Do you know what the Sermon on the Mount does? Is it shows that the kingdom of heaven is available to everyone. If you're here this morning and you're poor and needy, the kingdom of heaven is available to you. If you're here this morning and people have rejected you and people have abused you and things have not gone the way you think they should go in life, the kingdom of heaven is available to you. 
and you follow that through, that sermon through that Jesus gave, and you know what it says? It says, come to me, and this is the way your life will be. When you enter into the kingdom of heaven, this is the way life is. This is the way life is. This is the way real life is. It's not some more rules that we're supposed to follow that we can't even, that we can't even keep, but it's an invitation for us to come to God himself and he will make a whole new way for us to live. He will make something He will make something out of our life, which is what we were created for. Intimacy with him, purpose and destiny and direction. It's all there. And it's what you've always wanted, even though you didn't think you did. And you know where it is? It's upstream. It's upstream. It's there. It's there. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, I so thank you this morning that there is hope for each one of us. I thank you this morning that you bring life to your people. I thank you, Father, that oh, just for so many things, Thank you that we can know you, that you're not some unknowable force. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed this morning, how many of you would say, Chuck, in all honesty, in my life I've just been flowing downstream? but I want to change that. Could you show me by raising your hand? Yeah, many hands. Many hands. Father, I pray for the people that raised their hands. Father, give them the courage to start swimming upstream. Give them the courage. Change their hearts where where their hearts need to be changed. Wrap your arms of love around them. Father, in the quietness of this moment, Father, may their minds be clear and may they recognize you and speak to their hearts, Father. Show them how much you love them. bless them, Lord. I just want to say, if you heard words of condemnation, that wasn't God. But if you heard loving words that's encouraging you, that there is life ahead for you, that was God. God.